All right. Welcome everyone to this week's GOCC. Um, we're very happy to have Alex Wilson speaking. Um, before I introduce him, I want to remind everyone of the community statements or the community statement. So this is, we are all learning. Everyone has something to contribute and no one has all the answers. Okay, so without further ado, I'm very happy to have Alex Wilson who will be telling us about a diagram-like basis for the multi-set partition algebra. All right, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna actually start here with a picture because I am gonna be subjecting you to some algebra later, but I thought we'd have a bit of a gentle start. This is an example of what we're gonna call a partition diagram. And so the important features to notice here are that it has R labeled vertices on the top and the bottom for some positive R. And the vertices are grouped together into connected components by edges. And so what I find interesting about these diagrams is actually a product structure on them. And so there's this formula for multiplication. And if we want to multiply two diagrams, what we'll do is we'll put one on top of the other. We'll identify vertices in the middle. And then we're going to restrict to just the very top and the very bottom, preserving which vertices are connected. And so here, because these two are connected, these two at the top will be connected in the resulting diagram. This one is connected through the middle to this one, so these two will be connected in the resulting diagram. These two don't touch the middle at all, so nothing's going to help them. They're going to stay isolated there. Okay, so the first bit of this talk is to try and show you where these kinds of diagrams and this formula show up naturally when studying representation theory. And so to do that, I have to introduce a few objects. When I say Vn, I just mean an n-dimensional complex vector space. You might as well think of it as c to the n. Gln is going to be our group of n by n invertible matrices over c. And this Vn, this little o times r, that's going to be the rth tensor power of Vn. So we can think of this as just sequences of r vectors from Vn. And we sort of write them in a line with this little o times symbol between them. It turns out it's actually like linear combinations of these, but we're not going to lose out at all if we just think about it in terms of sequences because we're able to do all of our computations on a basis. So GLN is going to act on this tensor power in the sort of diagonal way, where if A is going to act on the sequence, it just acts on each vector in the sequence as you normally would with a matrix, right? You're just going to do this matrix vector multiplication. We have a second action on this tensor power. And that's of the symmetric group on our symbols SR. So what this is going to do is it's going to permute the tensor factors. So instead of you know, acting on this sort of diagonally, it's going to rearrange the factors based on this permutation sigma. And so we have these two actions, one of GLN and one of SR, on this tensor power. And a really natural question is, how do these actions interact with each other? And so it's not too hard to convince yourself that these two things are going to commute with each other. Because if we're acting diagonally by that same matrix A on everything, it doesn't matter if we rearrange our factors before and after. But something even stronger is true. These actions are what are called mutual centralizers. And so what that means is, well, I sort of think of it as they sort of determine each other. And precisely how they do is if you take this end SR of this R tensor power, so these are all the maps from the tensor power back to itself that commute with this SR action, those maps are generated by the GLN action. And so if you want to know what the GLN action is, it's completely recoverable by just asking what are the maps that commute with the SR action. And the same is true if you exchange the role of GLN and SR. If you ask for all of the maps that commute with the GLN action, those are generated by the SR action. And so this is an example of uh, the phenomenon of sure vial duality. So this was first discovered by Schur and then popularized by Vial, who used it to classify uh, representations of the unitary group and general linear group. And so if this is the first time you're seeing sure vial duality, the main thing I want you to take away from it is it connects the representation theory of the two objects. So if you want to study representations of an object, you can kind of study either of these objects and learn about both of them. But if you're familiar with some of the representation theoretic language, uh, more precisely, at the bottom here, this gives us a decomposition of this Rth tensor power as a GLN cross SR module into this nice sort of multiplicity-free thing where we have just pairing up of these GLN modules and these SR modules. And so this sets up a correspondence between the irreducible representations of the two objects. But yeah, the main takeaway is just it connects the representation theory, and so that's why I'm interested in this sort of scenario. <laughs> 
So I'm really interested in the symmetric group. So I want to squeeze some more information out of this picture about the symmetric group. And as luck would have it, there is another copy of the symmetric group hiding here as the n by n permutation matrices in GLN. And so what we want to do is sort of draw the seesaw picture where we take this GLN action and we restrict it down to SN. And we sort of ask, well, what's going to be dual to that? What are all of the maps that commute with now this SN action on this rth tensor power? And so to get a sense of what it's kind of like to work with these decentralizers, I want to walk through this classical case of kind of building up this particular centralizer. And so to do that, first we want to get a sense of what exactly this SN action is concretely. And so if we have a basis E1 through EN of our n-dimensional vector space VN, if we want a basis for the tensor power, that's indexed by these sequences of numbers, um, our numbers from one to n. And I like to use this sort of notation where I have e sub i as the sequence, just means this e sub i1 tensor up through e sub i r. And a permutation sigma and sn is going to act on this. Remember, this is restricting that diagonal GLN action. So sigma should act on each of these vectors, e i1 through e i r individually. And it does so as a permutation matrix, which so just permutes these basis vectors. So we get this E sigma I1 up through E sigma IR. And I like to sort of write that in shorthand as this E sub sigma of I. So sigma of the sequence just means I'm applying sigma to each element in the sequence. So can I just yep. pause and make sure I'm following this? So our big S and the, 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 I guess that would be the SR action mm -hmm. permutes my vector spaces. The SN action permutes the coordinate axes inside of my vector spaces. Yes. Well, yes. It, depending on the basis you chose, but yeah, I will always choose the orthogonal one. <laughs> yes. OK. Right, OK. So yeah, that's what our SN action does. Um, and sort of on this basis, it essentially just takes one of our basis elements, this E sub i, and takes it to this E sub sigma i, where sigma i just applies sigma to each element of our indexing sequence. OK, so now we want to sort of move one step up and think about endomorphisms of the tensor power. So now we want to think about maps of this tensor power. And I like to think of these as matrices. That helps me sort of think about it. And if we have some m, an element of these endomorphisms of the rth tensor power, we can describe it by its matrix coefficients relative to this basis, EI. And so we just write MEI is equal to the sum over J of this M, I, J, E, J. And so we really just have this big matrix M, and we have all these matrix coefficients M, I, J. And if you sort of write out all these conditions where if you apply M, then sigma, it needs to be the same as if you apply sigma and then M, the condition that M commutes with all of these sigmas amounts to this condition on the matrix coefficients, that for each pair of sequences i and j and permutation sigma, m i j has to be the same as m sigma i m sigma j. OK, there's a lot of equations and formulas. And so I think it's really helpful to visualize this written out as a matrix. So if we're looking at when n equals 3 and r equals 2, we're looking at the second tensor power. So our bases are indexed by these sequences of length two of numbers from one to three. Effectively, what that condition is saying is that if in this matrix, the coefficient at one, 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 one is some value A, if I apply the transposition one, two, I get two, 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 two. And so then my value at that position, two, 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 two also has to be A. And the same is true if I apply, say, this transposition 1, 3, and I get this 3, 3, 3, 3. And so those three things all have the same value. And you can do the same thing with this like orange column. If you have some b in this position 1, 2, 1, 3, if you hit it with this transposition 1, 2, you get this 2, 1, 2, 3 over here. And you get these six coordinates in the matrix that have to have the same value. And so effectively, what we have is for every orbit of these pairs of sequences under this SN action, we have sort of a set of matrix coefficients that have to be the same. And so in this way, we can describe a basis for this space of endomorphisms. 
where each orbit represents a basis element. And how we get our basis element is by essentially just saying, replace all of these Bs with ones, everything else with zeros. And that's going to be the basis element corresponding to this second orbit. OK, so we have some idea of how to describe this space with this basis from these orbits. Um, then the question sort of becomes, how can we nicely represent each of these orbits? And that's where these diagrams come back in. So if we look at these three orbits, I can think about drawing a picture for them. And how I'm going to do that is I'm going to think about my second sequence. So I have a pair of sequences. My second sequence kind of sits at the bottom of my picture. My first sequence at the top. And here, in this orbit, you can describe this orbit by saying all four things are the same. And this gives you all of these pairs of sequences where all four things are the same. And so I can connect up these four vertices to represent the fact that all four of those should have the same value. In this orange one, if you look along here, this is all these pairs of sequences where the first two values are the same. The second two are different from each other and different from those first values. And so this orange one would correspond to this picture, where the first element of each sequence is the same, connected by this edge. And the second element is different in both cases. In this last one, our second sequence has these two things connected, because they're going to be the same. Our first one, the two are different. OK, so this is just some way that we can try to write down these orbits graphically. But we have to be a little bit careful. The underlying object here is really a set partition. And so if we label our diagrams, say the number is 1 through r up top and a 1 bar through r bar on the bottom, if we take the connected components together, that gives us this set partition. So here, all four are in one block, and so we get this single block. Here, the 1 and the 1 bar are connected, so they should be in a block together. The 2 and the 2 bar are by themselves, so they should be in their own blocks. And we're going to write this uh, pi sub 2r for the set of these set partitions from 1 through r and 1 bar through r bar. And so the reason it's important that we keep in mind that the underlying structure is really these set partitions is that this graphical representation is not unique. Oops. I don't know how I managed to scroll back so far with one swipe. If I knew how to do that on purpose, that would be great. OK, so. These graphic representations are not unique, because if you look at this picture, the one on the right is telling you that two should be the same as one, one the same as one bar, one bar the same as two bar. Well, then that means the two bars the same as two. So both of these represent that first orbit, where everything is all the same. And so we really think of a diagram as an equivalence class of these graphs on these vertices with the same connected components. So each diagram corresponds to one set partition by just looking at the connected components, but you could write down a lot of graphs that correspond to the same set partition. OK, so as a big example, if we're looking at the endomorphisms of the second tensor power of V4 that can meet with the S4 action, that is a basis indexed by these 15 diagrams. And so I sneakily swapped something from my previous example. Earlier, I was doing S3 and V3. And I did that there because I didn't want to do like a 16 by 16 matrix. But the reason I had to uh, adjust that here is because of this diagram here. This diagram is telling us that we have an orbit that corresponds to pairs of sequences where all four elements are different. This can't appear for only in V3, because we only have three basis elements. So we would need n to be at least 2r for this diagram to appear. And it turns out as long as n is at least 2r, all of these diagrams will appear. That condition that n is at least 2r is also really important for um, representation theoretic properties of the objects we're looking at. And if you want to know more about that, I can talk about it later. But because of that, we're going to assume that n is at least 2r for the rest of the talk. And then we have all of our diagrams appearing. Uh, I've got a quick oh, question. Go um, so my exponent, which is r, is yes. the number of columns I have? Um, let's see. 
So yes, that's the number of vertices you have on the top and the bottom. So you have a total of two R vertices. OK, great. Cool. OK. So now we're going to call this object, this end SN of the R tensor power of VN, the partition algebra, PRN. So it was introduced by Jones and Martin in the 90s. And the reason it's called partition algebra is exactly because we have these bases indexed by these set partitions. And the basis that we just obtained is called the orbit basis, because we found it by looking at orbits of this SN action. And so I'm going to write that as T sub pi for pi one of these set partitions. Now I'm going to immediately introduce you to a second basis. So there's a basis L sub pi called the diagram basis. And so it's a pretty simple change of basis here. If you want to write the element L sub pi, you need to take the sum over all set partitions nu that are coarser than pi, and I'll say more about that in a second, of this T sub nu. And so if we want the set partitions that are coarser than pi, we just look at all of the set partitions we can obtain by combining blocks of pi. So in this example, we're looking at computing L sub this diagram. And so we get, well, that same diagram back. We get the diagram from combining these two blocks, combining these two blocks, combining these two blocks, or finally combining all three of the blocks. OK, so we have now this diagram basis. And the reason we want to introduce this diagram basis, I think, becomes sort of clear in this next example. So this is an algebra. We should be able to multiply things. So you can think about it as these are, these are matrices we're multiplying. Or if you like thinking of, of them as these endomorphisms, we are composing these endomorphisms. So we'd like to know what happens if we take two basis elements and multiply them. So for the orbit basis, here if we multiply these two diagrams, mm -hmm. we get sort of this mess. We get this like n minus 4, n minus 3, n minus 2 junk. But if we use the diagram basis, we get something much, much closer to that monoid structure I promised you at the start. And so that's the main motivation for defining this other basis, is that you get a much nicer product, and it's much more sort of intuitive and predictable. And you can draw a lot more on sort of the, the combinatorics of the diagrams to understand it. Um, but first, I do need to address the one difference from the monoid structure I gave you earlier, which is where this n is coming from. And so we just have to slightly amend our product from earlier. We're still going to put the first diagram on top of the second. We're still going to restrict to the very top and bottom. But now we need to account for this one thing we didn't account for, which is these components are stranded in the middle that don't touch the very top or the very bottom. Because in our previous product, we just completely forgot about them. And so to kind of record those, what we're going to do is we're going to include a coefficient of n which is our dimension of our Vn. Also, it's the n for our Sn. Um, we're going to record a factor of n for every component that was stranded in the middle. All right. Here. Yeah, OK. So the, the general story here is we have you know, some centralizer we want to understand. There's a really natural basis that shows up called the orbit basis that we get from just looking at orbits of our group action. But if we change our basis, we get one that's that much better reflects the multiplicative structure of our algebra. And so now I want to talk some more about some variations on the partition algebra. And so the first one is you can vary what group you're acting by. In our sort of seesaw, we went from GLN down to SN. But there are a lot of ways, places we could have stopped in between. So for example, we could have looked at this orthogonal group. We could have looked at this complex reflection group, GMPN. Um, but you can also act by other things, the other things that have natural actions on this R tensor power, like these quantum groups, UQGL2 and UQSL2. And so what ends up happening is you get some centralizer on the other side, and all of these centralizers are subalgebras of the partition algebra. And so we already saw in this classical Schervail duality, when we acted by GLN, we got this symmetric group SR, and how that appears in the partition algebra is matchings of one vertex from the bottom and one vertex from the top. And so this here is some like transposition. The orthogonal group ON, the thing that's sort of dual to it, that centralizes it, is something called the Brouwer algebra. So these are these diagrams that are now 
slightly more relaxed than the symmetric group, we allow all matchings. So you could match something from the bottom, something on the bottom, or top to top. And so you get a lot of these interesting centralizer algebras here. These are also often called diagram algebras because they can be described using these partition diagrams. Um, but what I want to sort of focus on, and what I did focus on in my work, was a different way of varying this. So rather than changing up what group we're acting by, we want to change up the space we're acting upon. And so in order to do that, I have to introduce a couple more objects. So when I write VNK, I'm talking about the space of n by k matrices over C. And this PRVNK is the space of homogeneous polynomial forms on VNK. Now that's a lot of words, but you can just think of those as homogeneous polynomials of degree R with variables that look like x, i, j, where i is between 1 and n, and j is between 1 and k. And these are supposed to be polynomial forms on VNK, and so that just means that they have to somehow take in a matrix and spit out a complex number. And the way that they're going to do that is that each variable x, i, j is going to pick out the entry i, j in a matrix. And so in this example here, this x, 1, 2 picks out this entry in position 1, 2 and gives us 2. This 1, 3 picks out this 3, and this 2, 2 picks out this 5. And so this spits out the number 30 when it's sort of given this matrix. Mm -hmm. OK. So we want to kind of repeat some of the story with the partition algebra. So we want some kind of GLN action um, that shows up naturally that we can try and restrict to permutation matrices. And so in the 80s, Roger Howe determines that GLN and GLK form a mutually centralizing pair on this space when GLN acts by sort of sneaking in and multiplying on the left of your input, and GLK sneaks in on the right of your input. And so it makes sense because of the associativity of the product. These should commute with each other, but it turns out the even nicer, stronger thing is true, and they're a mutually centralizing pair. So you get an analogous, nice decomposition, and you get um, nice correspondence between the representation theory of the two objects. But again, we really like the symmetric group. So we want to ride the seesaw again and try to see if we can find something that sits opposite to the symmetric group. And so we're going to restrict our GLN action down to SN and look at these endomorphisms of this space of polynomial forms that commute with the SN action. And so uh, Rosa Oriana and Mike Zabraki took a look at this uh, centralizer algebra, and they described an orbit basis for it. So they found it by looking at the orbits of this SN action, and they called it MPRKN, the multiset partition algebra. And so uh, this basis that they have is indexed by diagrams whose vertices are colored from a set of K colors, and identically colored vertices among the top or among the bottom are indistinguishable. And so these three pictures at the bottom of the slide actually all represent the same diagram. So if you look at the first two, all I did from here to here is I just erased some extra edges, right? I didn't change anything about the connected components at all. But from here to here, I was able to exchange the role of the vertices. So these two blue vertices I just swapped, these two orange vertices I just swapped. And so these are kind of wiggly diagrams where you can just change the role of the identically colored vertices in the top or the bottom. And so another way we can try and see this is by thinking again about the underlying partition structure. So if we start with this diagram, we're going to label sort of the blue vertices up top with ones, the orange vertices up top with twos, the blue vertices on bottom with one bars, the orange ones on bottom with two bars. And if we take this connected component here, this triangle, that corresponds to this block one, one bar, two bar. Then we have this one on its own, and we have this two, two, two bar, two bar, which forms this block. So essentially, we get these set partitions, but now repetition is allowed. <clears throat> And so now we're going to write this pi tilde 
two R K for the set of multi-set partitions, we have R entries each from the numbers one to K and one bar to K bar. And so that's sort of precisely all of the multi-step partitions that you can get by drawing these diagrams where you have R vertices on the top, R vertices on the bottom, and you're allowed K different colors to color them in. And I'm going to consistently just use blue to stand for one and orange to stand for two. But I want to pause just a second here. How are people feeling about these multi-step partition diagrams? I don't think I quite understand what you mean by indistinguishable. Yeah. Um, so um, maybe one way we can think about it is if I were to say, just swap the role of these two blue vertices. So if I were to like mm -hmm. redraw this triangle to now be this, my set partition doesn't change at all. Right, because I just swapped these two right. ones, but those are the same thing. Yes, but how is that necessarily different from uh, like just ordinary set partitions? Because you should be able to permute those top, like if you just circle around the uh, vertices on the top of an ordinary of these set partitions, you get a different, like the, the diagrams are still in the same class, right? You still get the well, same set partition out of them. They aren't the same set partition. So an example of that is maybe if I draw sort of these two set partition pictures. So this one on the left corresponds to this like one, one ah. bar, two bar, mm -hmm. two. This one corresponds to one, one, I'll say maybe two, one bar, two bar. OK, right. So those are truly different set partitions. Yes. OK. And here, if we have things that are the same color, we now we actually think about those as just being mm -hmm. the same. OK. OK, so now if you take the orbit basis that they wrote down and write it as um, x sub pi tilde, um, so yeah, Odan Zabraki came up with this orbit basis. And here's an example of what the multiplication looks like. And this looks a lot like the orbit basis multiplication for the partition algebra. Um, one just notable exception is that there's like this coefficient two out front in the partition algebra. You should generally have things that are all monic. And so here now it's actually even a little bit messier than the orbit basis for the uh, partition algebra. Um, and so basically when I was, you know, trying to look for a thesis problem, this is one option that Rosa handed me was, okay, can you find a nicer basis for this algebra? You, you have this orbit basis. Can you try and do something like what's been done for the partition algebra and find something that's like the diagram basis? And so the good news is I did. Um, and so in order to tell you about that, I need to take what might feel like kind of a detour and tell you briefly about another algebra. And so the setup here is I have an algebra ARN sitting inside the partition algebra. So you can think of this as anything on that table that we had, maybe like the first, I think like four rows of that table, um, where we have some subset of the um, allowed diagrams. But here I'm requiring the symmetric group to be contained in that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a new diagram, a tilde RKN, called the corresponding painted algebra. And so its basis is given by this d pi tilde, where pi tilde is obtained by coloring the vertices of a diagram in ARN. So as an example of that, if we look at the Brouwer algebra, B2N, these are all the matchings on these uh, four vertices. We just take this and we color it in in every possible way with these two colors. And so what you'll notice is that this cross seems to appear very infrequently. And that's because if we were to paint the top two things of this, say, both blue, well, those are indistinguishable. So we could just uncross it. We could just exchange the role of those two. So really what's happening is that these two are very often just projecting onto the same diagram. Okay, so we take 
all of these diagrams from the subalgebra, we paint them in every possible way. But I called this the painted algebra. And so I can't just give you a basis. I also tell you how to multiply things. And so the formula for multiplying two of these painted diagrams looks like this. So like the partition algebra, we're going to take one and set it on top of the other. And we have to do a quick check. The colors in the middle have to match. We have to be able to put blue on top of blue and orange on top of orange. Or otherwise, the product is going to be 0. And so the next thing that we do is we keep this top diagram completely fixed. So if you look here, that's just the same exact diagram written four times. And what we do to the bottom diagram is we write it down, and then we write it down swapping the two blue vertices. Then we swap the two orange vertices. Then we swap the blue and the orange vertices. So what we're doing is we're looking at all the different ways to permute the top of the second diagram. And we're only allowed to swap vertices of the same color. And once we've done that, now we sort of look at what is actually sitting above. And we identify those and multiply them as if they were, the, they were just partition diagrams. So this is we just now do exactly the product from the very start, where we identify the middle and restrict to the very top and the very bottom. And sometimes we'll have to have a coefficient of n if we have a component stranded in the middle, and not otherwise. OK, so essentially, what we're doing is we're just looking over all the possible ways for these two things to meet and averaging over that. And so we get 1 quarter of the sum of these four diagrams. How do we feel about that? I feel good. I'm naturally wondering what happens when I do the same thing to the top diagram. Uh, um, but which thing to the top diagram? So we, yeah, we, we try to the bottom diagram in all ways. What if I permute the bottom and the top? And so I get like, yeah, you should million. get the same thing as long as you divide out by the total number of permutations you applied. Um, because essentially you're just going to get the same the same thing twice. Um, okay. because you're essentially looking at a young subgroup, right? Of you're permuting mm. one and two and three and four. And in that case, you're just looking at, well, if you just take the product of the young subgroup with itself, you just get that same thing a number of times equal to the size of the young subgroup. So really, we're gonna see later how this mm -hmm. is actually we're just like shoving an item potent in between. And this particular way is just us making a decision about kind of how we're going to apply that. And the way to sure. apply each of those switches is just to choose one of them and apply each of the permutations to it. Uh, I guess something just occurred to me. Um, is this product commutative? No. It shouldn't be, but OK, yeah. Nope. Well, neither is the, the partition algebra. Product. Right, no, the partition algebra is yep. like definitely not commutative, but yep. OK. Yeah, and this, this is not going to be commutative. All right. OK, and so I guess the, the big punchline is the reason I took this detour is, um, actually, I didn't. This is the same, the same algebra. Um, so the big theorem is actually it handles a bit of a, a wider case than I was even hoping for at the start, which is if I have any group G sitting between SN and GLN, um, I can ask for what its centralizer is under kind of this Shervile duality paradigm. And it's going to be something sitting inside the partition algebra. And so we can think of it as, you know, maybe it's this, this span of diagrams with certain conditions. If we then want to know what the centralizer of that same G is acting now on sort of in this, this how duality on these polynomial forms, that's going to be the corresponding painted algebra. And so as a corollary, one particular case is when we set G equal to SN, we have that the multi-set partition algebra is just the painted partition algebra. And so we have this nice basis where we just take all of our partition diagrams, color them in every possible way, and get this nice averaging product. And so we call this D sub pi tilde the diagram-like basis. OK. So I think what I want to do, yeah, is I want to show you briefly this picture that kind of summarizes what this theorem adds to the picture. Um, on the left-hand side, we have our Shervile duality. 
And so this diagonal corresponds to this classical servile duality between the symmetric group and GLN. And this corresponds to that story we told at the start of trying to find this partition algebra that centralizes the SN. And so on the right, we have this classical how duality, and we have the story of the multi-step partition algebra. And so now what this theorem does is it kind of gives us all of the space in between, any group we have in between this SN and GLN. If we know what its centralizer is under um, Shervile duality, so for example, we have ON here and the Brouwer algebra over here, then if we want its centralizer under the how duality, we just have to paint in the diagrams. And so if we want to know what's the opposite to the orthogonal group in this, this how duality, we just get all of these painted matchings. Okay, so I think with the rest of the time, what I want to do is first talk a little bit about some of the representation theory. I want to show you at least sort of one application of how we were able to use this new basis to do something cool. And then I want to try and walk through some of the idea of where this basis comes from and like how, how the proof goes. And so for the representation theory to make sure we're on the same page, um, when I say a partition lambda of n, I mean a weekly decreasing sequence, lambda one through lambda l of positive integers that sum up to n. And the Young diagram of lambda is an array of left justified boxes with lambda i boxes in the i throw from the bottom. So I'm using the French notation. If you don't like it, you can view the talk upside down in a mirror. All right. A multi-set partition tableau of shape lambda is going to be a filling of lambda's Young diagram like this. The entries are going to be multi-sets. And we have some empty boxes in the first row, at least as many, at least enough so that the um, empty boxes come as far as the second row. And so a good way to remember this is essentially we have two different kinds of contents that we want to keep separate. And so up here is a kind of content where the shape really matters. And the empty boxes are just trying to push this shape where this content over here, where there is no really shape data off to the side. So it doesn't interact with the shape data. And so this is also maybe another way you can see why that condition that n has to be at least 2r shows up is that ends up being a condition on the size of our um, tableau because we need to have enough space for the empty boxes. OK, so I'm going to write this MSPT lambda RK for the set of these tableau with a total of r numbers where the numbers range from 1 to k. And so we can order our multisets by this last letter order. And so essentially what you do is you just look at the largest element in each multiset, and whichever has the larger largest element wins. If there's a tie, you sort of cross them out and move to the left. And if you keep tying and one of them is left standing and the other is left empty, then the longer one wins. And so using this, we can define a semi-standard multiset partition tableau, which has rows weakly increasing and columns strictly increasing. I'm going to write this um, SSMPT, lambda RK, for the set of these. And so I'm just going to give you one example to give you a sense of what sort of the action of the diagrams on the tableau looks like. OK, so I'm doing the action of this diagram on this tableau. And so I'm going to zoom in to one particular case. And so essentially what we're doing is we're taking the content of the tableau and we're sort of pulling it up into kind of this one row partition. And then what we do is we set our diagram atop that. And now we're permuting the bottom of our diagram. And so here we could just as well permute the contents of the tableau instead, just like we talked about earlier. But I think things just make more sense if I permute the diagram in this case. And so we have these three different permutations of the bottom of the diagram. Right, so essentially just this single blue could be here, it could be over here, or it could be over here. And so once we've fixed some order there, what we do is we start here, and we look up at what this propagates up to. So this one propagates up to a one. And so what ends up happening is this one is replaced again with a one. This one here propagates up to this one, two. 
So its box is replaced with one, two. This two, two propagates up to the single two. So it's replaced with a two. And then anything that's up at the very top of our diagram that doesn't interact with the tableau at all, that's what gets shoved sort of in this basement down here in this, this non-shaped section of our tableau. So I'm going to take a pause here and just looking at this, just this first sort of column. How are we feeling about that? Why does my one in the bottom right not propagate up to a one? Um, let's see. So this one gets sucked in to this. Okay. Yeah. So it's tricky to try to show you with one example what the action looks like. But sure. Okay. Essentially, what's happening there is it's getting sucked in. Okay. Yeah. Really, I think about sort of the shaped content is really the privileged content, and it's the important one. And this is just where we shove all the extras. Okay. And so, under a different order, we could have a different tableau that shows up. So this one now propagates up to the one two. Now it's this one that propagates up to the one. Again, the two, two propagates up to the two. And we get this two in the basement. And this last one shows you a situation where things can kind of go wrong. And so here, these two ones get combined. We didn't care if a one from the basement got combined in. But if two boxes above the basement get combined, then we just think about it as we can't even have a tableau of the right shape. Because we're going to end up with some like empty box. These two boxes get squished together. And so we're just going to zero that out. We're not even going to include it in our final result. OK, and so in total, what ends up happening is you get sort of this averaging. We had these three permutations. And so we have one third the sum of these two tableau. Um, and you'll notice that one of these tableau is not semi-standard. We actually have a decrease here. And so there's a straightening algorithm that lets you rewrite it as a linear combination of semi-standard tableau. And that straightening algorithm actually looks exactly like the one for the irreducible SN representations, if you're familiar with that. And so sort of the main theorem here is that if you take this action on the semi-standard multi-set partition tableau, then the span of these tableau of shape lambda, written MPRK superscript lambda, is an irreducible representation of the multi-set partition algebra. And if you take all of these lambdas that satisfy this condition, this condition essentially just says you have to have at least one semi-standard multi-set partition tableau of that shape. If you take those together, that's a complete set of irreducible representations. So they're all pairwise non-isomorphic, and every irreducible representation is isomorphic to one of them. And so this is essentially a construction of the irreducible representations on tableau. Okay. And so now I want to give you a bit of a sense of how the proof shakes out. And so this is sort of the, the newest part of the talk. And so I'm very interested to hear maybe some feedback on what you think about it. Um, but essentially what we're going to do is we're going to break our space of polynomial forms into pieces. And that decomposition is going to just lead us to the right kind of way to think about um, this multi-set partition algebra. And so what the piece um, u sub a is, is it's sort of collecting all of the um, monomials that have a certain uh, multiplicity of their second index. So here, u2, 2, 2 is going to collect all of the things that have a second index 1 twice, second index 2 twice. And so if you write WRK for all the weak compositions of R of length K, that's all the possible multiplicities for these uh, second indices, then you get a decomposition of this PRVNK as a direct sum of these UAs. Um, and so you can see pretty clearly that's a direct sum of vector spaces, but it turns out this is also a direct sum of GLN modules. So each of these UAs, if you act on these monomials by this, this action of sneaking in before you um, plug in your uh, matrix, you don't change the multiplicities of the indices. So you actually stay inside this UA piece. And so it's actually a GLN submodule. So you, you decompose it into these pieces. 
And then you actually introduce these, these young subgroups. And so this is where the, this young subgroup shows up. Um, so this S sub A is going to be this young subgroup, for example, S22 corresponds to this all these permutations that permute one and two, permute three and four, but can't exchange between them. And this lowercase s a, which I hope is going to look reasonably distinct in my handwriting, um, is this idempotent from the young subgroup. So you divide by the order of your young subgroup and then just add up all the permutations in the young subgroup. And so for s22, that looks like these four permutations where we have everything in order, swap the first two, swap the second two, then swap both. And so that's exactly what we saw in that product earlier. And so if we remember that SR acts on this R tensor power by permuting factors, we can actually take an element of this tensor power and hit it with this idempotent. And we get sort of this averaged thing here. So here we have this E1, E2, E2, E2. We hit it with this idempotent. We get this 1 half E1, E2, 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 plus this E2, E1, E2, E2. So essentially, we just get these two things get swapped. So I think a nice way to think about this is going to show up when we see this isomorphism. If we take the, this uh, space UA, we can map it into our R tensor power by basically just grabbing the first index each time. So here's 1, 2, 2, 2. Here we have 1, 2, 2, 2. But because these are polynomials, right? we could swap these two things with index 1. So this could become 2, 1, 1, 1 instead. We have to sort of think of these two positions as being the same. And so that's exactly what this idempotent is doing. It's this kind of averaging. And it's making these two the same. And so if you're familiar at all with these constructions of symmetric powers, this is essentially what we're looking at here. But sort of the, the core idea to take away is that as vector spaces, this piece UA is the same as taking this R tensor power and hitting it with an idempotent, which is good because we want to connect this to the partition algebra somehow. And the partition algebra comes from this R tensor power. These two objects, the UA and the tensor power projected by the idempotent, both have a GLN action. The UA, we have it as sort of inherited as these um, polynomial forms. For this R tensor power, we have this diagonal action. But this isomorphism of vector spaces is not an isomorphism of GLN modules. And in fact, if we take some matrix M, if we try to act by the matrix M and then apply the map phi, that's the same as applying the map phi and then acting by M inverse. So it actually reverses M when you try to pull it through. So this is kind of a weird behavior for the map to have, but it turns out this isn't going to be a problem because we care about endomorphisms. And so what ends up happening is this isomorphism of vector spaces here induces an isomorphism of algebras on the endomorphisms by conjugating by that phi. And so we hit with this phi inverse and phi, and so we take some endomorphism of this space and we get an endomorphism of the other space. And so if we have some M in GLN, as we pull it through, it gets flipped to an M inverse, but then it gets flipped back to an M. And so we actually have an isomorphism of the endomorphisms that commute with the G action here. And so the upshot here is that we now have this isomorphism, that the endomorphisms that commute with G of our polynomial forms are the same as the endomorphisms of this nice direct sum of these things that are just projections by idempotents. And so what we're able to do is we're able to pull this direct sum out of the endomorphisms and get a sum over these homomorphisms from S, B, V, N to the R tensor power to S, A, V, N to the R tensor power that commute with the G action. And it turns out that each of these pieces is isomorphic to this. So if we have you know, some map from SB VN to the R tensor power to SA times VN to the R tensor power, it's the same as just taking a map from the tensor power to itself and composing it with an idempotent on each side. 
And if you carefully follow through each of the isomorphisms here, the product at the end looks something like this, where we have some piece, this pi, which I really think of as being one of my set partitions because my underlying algebra I'm thinking of is the partition algebra. You have this pi with this idempotent on either side. You have this gamma with idempotent on either side. You need the B and the C to agree. And you just take this product inside your endomorphisms of your tensor power. And so to see it's just like a side by side, and so that I leave you with pictures instead of a bunch of equations, what's really happening here is that this delta in front, that's what gives us our check that the colors match in the middle. If you expand out this SB, right, it was this sum over all of these permutations in um, this young subgroup you end up with exactly this sort of picture where you divide by this young subgroup, you stick this sigma in between, and you might as well think of it as grouped like this, where you have the sigma times the gamma. And so that's what permutes the top of your second diagram in these four different ways. All right, and I think, yeah, quick summary is just, we decomposed the space that led to a natural decomposition of the endomorphisms on the space. And the diagram like basis comes from sandwiching this item potent in between the two partition diagrams. All right, that's all I've got. Let's thank our speaker. And do we have any questions? I have a question about like what's known in general about the like families of idempotents for this algebra. Um, so, some of them, but yeah, sorry, what were you gonna say? Um, um, let's see. So for which algebra? The multi-set partition algebra. Right. Um, so not a ton is known. Um, so the idempotents that I sort of described. Mm -hmm. um, they kind of show up in the multi-set partition algebra, um, and they look something like this, where you have some number of, say, like blue things, some number of orange things in this nice kind of symmetric way, mm -hmm. and you just have like these vertical bars. So it looks like like an identity element in the partition algebra, but colored in. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you look at all of these, these are a set of oh, there's a bunch of adjectives. They're like uh, complete orthogonal idempotents. So mm -hmm. yeah, if you add them all up, you get the identity and they're orthogonal to each other. If you multiply any two of them, you get zero. Mm -hmm. And so really what this kind of construction is reflecting is a decomposition of the multi-set partition algebra via these orthogonal idempotents. Mm -hmm. um, and you can definitely cook up a lot of other idempotents, mm -hmm. um, but it's not super clear how to classify them. Um, you can definitely pretty easily classify all of the basis elements that are idempotents, but of course you might end up in weird situations where you have sums of these diagram-like basis elements that could also be idempotents. Mm -hmm. And so that's where things get a bit hairy. Um, and that also does circle back to something nice to comment on, which is for the partition algebra, the diagram basis has this really nice property where it's built on top of a monoid. If you take mm -hmm. two basis elements, you get maybe a scaled version of one basis element. Um, here, in the multi-step partition algebra world, if we're multiplying two of our basis elements, we get a sum. And so it's not clear to us that that has to happen. It really feels like it, having spent a long time with these. Um, but it's really hard to say, no, there isn't going to be some, some nice basis that works in general, where you always have this monoid property. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing we're really hopeful about is now that we have sort of a lot of information about these really natural intermediate algebras, that come from centralizers from G, that gives us some more constraints, right? Like it would feel pretty convincing if we could at least say there's not going to be any monoid basis that restricts nicely to say this Brouwer algebra. And so that's that's one thing that we we're going to try and think about. Cool. Thank you. I, I there... guess kind of extending on that answer to your question, uh -huh. um, you mentioned that. So you mentioned we had that nice basis in just the set partition algebra. Yes. And that came from looking at coarsenings 
Yes. Of your element. Is there a nat is there an extension of coarsenings to multi-sets? Yes. And so effectively, um, we do have the change of basis from Oriana and Zabraki's um, orbit basis to this diagram-like basis. Mm -hmm. um, and essentially what it looks like is you have these coarsenings. And mm -hmm. here you have to define them maybe slightly differently. You have to think about, I mean, really, as long as you just think about it in this high level of you can combine blocks, mm -hmm. um, then it's fine, right? So if I want to draw a coarsening of this, I just combine some blocks. Okay. Um, so it looks like a sum over coarsenings, but you have to include some extra coefficients out front. And those coefficients sort of depend on um, just a lot of, there's a lot of factorials there that just are um, ways that you can rearrange like um, identically colored vertices within the bottom of blocks and identical whole blocks. And so like you just get, there's, there's, there are a little bit weird coefficients. Um, and that's why I don't have it in this talk is because it just takes a while to try to describe what they are. But the overall shape of the change of basis is very similar. It is a sum over coarsenings with some extra coefficients. All right. Uh, what else? Was I, I, I think I had a couple of other extra questions. One is I hear monoidal structure and I go, great. Is there a co-monoidal structure? <laughs> um, hmm. That is a good question. Um, I think that, so I don't know much about that off the top of my head, but I think if you were curious about sort of co-structures in the world of partition algebras, mm -hmm. you might look up, Rosa has a paper about, I think it is uniform block permutations. Um, there's one that's quite recent and there's a bit of an older one. And it's the, the slightly older one that I'm thinking of. There's like a, they talk about a co-product structure in that setting. Okay, yeah, I I do a lot of research into Hopf monoids. And so I want both. <laughs> yeah. And I, I had one final question, which was whenever you're first defining this uh, set partition, um, you kind of justified it by looking at this uh, symmetric ac action on these ordered pairs of sequences. I can't remember exactly sure. the details. Yeah. And it struck me that it looks like there might be some natural, yes, um, that these might, there might be some natural map into non commutative symmetric functions. Uh, natural yeah. non commutative symmetric functions. <laughs> Um, because I mean, you've got the symmetric action, so you want want them to be symmetric. But then, but you've got you know one, two, and one, three, and so you would like the fact that x one is is in both to be separate from one, one, two, three. Yeah, and so I was wondering if I don't know much about that. Most most of what I know about you know sort of mm -hmm. the symmetric functions and and um, the partition algebra is people are interested in you know looking at um, sort of like Frobenius maps, trying to look at like characters in terms of these symmetric functions. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think I know much at all about people looking at non-commutative symmetric functions and the partition algebra. Okay. Um, but I'll admit I've never Googled those words. So you can maybe Google those words and you might find something. <laughs> yeah, I. it's only recently the non-commutative symmetric functions have really appeared on my radar. And now I'm starting to see like, oh, well, yeah, no, if you're trying hard enough, you can put them anywhere. Oh. Okay, I've run out of questions. <laughs> Are there any more questions for Alex? All right, that was a very nice talk. Um, let's give him one more round of applause. And I think we're at the hour. So maybe we can stop the recording. <laughs>